And I want to thank you so much for being here today. Today, we're going to be talking about unlocking your board's leadership skills for better governance. I love this. I love everything about boards because I know nonprofits sometimes struggle with boards, especially if you started a nonprofit. But I am Aretha Simons. I'm the webinar producer here, and I'm not going to be the speaker. I'm going to introduce the speaker in just a moment. I do want to let you know this is being recorded, and we are going to send you the slides and the video by tomorrow. If you have a question, feel free to type it in the chat, but we would love if you would put it in the Q&A section. If you need the closed caption, go ahead and tap on that CC button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. I have one quick announcement before I turn it over to our speaker. I'm so excited. We're gonna do an in-person event. So if you're in the San Francisco Bay Area, California area, we are going to do our first live event at our TechSoup headquarters. I don't know if you know this, but October, September 15th through October 15th is Hispanic Heritage Month. So that's what we're going to celebrate. We're going to have um, live event, food, um, fun, tech talk, networking from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. I'm going to put the link in the chat so that you can sign up and get your reminders. And we'll look forward to seeing you there. So I'm going to turn this over to our speaker. I'd like to introduce um, Emily Socash. What a cool name, right? She's the founder and CEO of the, of the Nonprofit Help Center. And Josh Palmer, he is the head of content with Onboard, who is one of our corporate partners with TechSoup. I'm so excited you're both here. Now, Josh, I think I'm going to turn this over to you. You guys have a great webinar. Yes, thank you so much, Aretha, for uh, warming up the room with your, uh, your, your engaging and warm personality. My name is Josh Palmer. I'm the head of content at Onboard. Uh, you can find us at onboardmeetings.com. Uh, we are a board governance solution uh, that does serve the nonprofit sector. We currently have more than 2,000 uh, nonprofit customers in our, um, our customer base. We're very proud to, to be able to serve that and help boards, uh, nonprofit boards specifically, achieve their, their uh, organization, organization's missions. I would be remiss to say, uh, if I didn't say that we do have special tech soup, discounts and pricing, as well as special pricing for federated and chapter uh, focused uh, nonprofit organizations. And just recently, this is big news for us, uh, we became uh, affiliated with the Microsoft Tech for Social Impact program, uh, which is an independent software vendor program. So we're very excited for that. Uh, that does not uh, surpass my excitement for the, the opportunity to introduce uh, a person who's one of my favorite recent um, uh, network peers, uh, Dr. Emily Sokash uh, from the nonprofit uh, Help Center. Uh, so without further ado, I'll let you take it away, Emily. Thank you so much. Hey, thanks, Josh. And thank you, Aretha. It is great to be with everybody. I keep seeing the participant number going higher and higher and higher. So as everybody is coming in, I'm just going to navigate my way through to bring up our deck for our time together today. So as Josh mentioned, my name is Dr. Emily Sokash. I'm an organizational leadership psychologist. And after spending about 22 years or so in the nonprofit sector, leading and raising funds for and turning around all sorts of nonprofits, um, back in 2018, I opted to found the Nonprofit Help Center. And we are all about training the people who power your mission. Uh, if you need to reach me, you'll have this contact information both now and after our time together. But we are going to be talking about the board leadership lens today. And just a couple of housekeeping items before I dive right in on our presentation. Uh, we do have the chat activated. Josh is going to be keeping an eye on that. And there will be a couple moments during our time where I ask for your opinions on things, you know, tell me how you're doing as a leader. Tell me a little bit about your board. Uh, and so Josh will be my Vanna for that purpose. And then also the Q&A is activated. And so if you do have questions along the way, I am happy to pause and we will just kind of uh, we'll just kind of riff about whatever is on your mind. So I am here to help you and to make this as much of a dialogue as we can while also sharing out some hopefully awesome and wonderful um, information for you. As Aretha mentioned, um, I am in not so sunny St. Petersburg, Florida today. So I just do want to give you just one quick caveat that if you do see me flicker, Josh and Aretha will pick up while I am reconnecting because uh, we, we do have a little bit of stormy weather happening through today. Um, as Josh mentioned, Onboard is the partnering presenter for today's conversation. And we are here to talk about board leadership and 
the leadership lens that we can really bring to our board members, whether you all are board members or your execs or you are professional staff that are working with board members. All of this will apply to you. We are going to slice our conversation today into three chunks of conversation. We're going to start by looking holistically at key leadership styles. Uh, we'll just kind of get our feet beneath us on what is leadership and what does it mean to you. We'll then turn to how we can implement board leadership assessments, primarily self-assessments, and then we'll bring it all together in a neat and tidy bow with fostering collaboration and strengthening relationships using these first two steps. And with that in mind, let's jump in on the importance of board leadership. So leadership at its core can be defined as influencing people to accomplish a common goal. Traditional leadership models focus on the leader's ability to inspire and motivate others. And it sets up a structure of action in which there's a specific leader and some number of followers. Traditional leadership actions can involve being directive, that's when we tell people what to do, or it can be participative, which is when we invite input from others. Now, if we look at leadership under the microscope, there are really three components to it. There's the imprint, that's the way that you are experienced as a leader by anybody who you work with and who you lead. There are the functions, those are the practices that you employ as you mobilize your colleagues in order to get things done. And then there are the motivations. These are the desires, the stimuli, the incentives that drive you to take a certain course of action and drive others to follow you. Now we'll come back to these motivations a little bit later in our time together today. But the importance of a board's leadership development relate to a couple critical nonprofit stats. So I pulled these uh, from a few studies that were done earlier this calendar year. So let's just kind of lay the table here, set the table. So the nonprofit in the United States, the nonprofit share of our gross domestic product is 6%. It's a small number, but it is not nothing when you consider that that 6% represents $2.62 trillion in revenue each year. 10% of our total workforce is employed by a nonprofit organization. That's one in 10 Americans are employed by a nonprofit. Now, when asked what their top challenge on their minds were uh, for 2024, nonprofit executives said, 37% of nonprofit executives said that their top challenge is their staffing capacity, their professional people power. And an additional 30% said their top challenge is recruitment and retention of those staff. So doing some quick math, we have 67% of the executives that were sampled by this. It was like a 400 person study. Looking at these numbers, we see one in three nonprofits is struggling with their staffing capacity. An additional one in three is looking for help in their recruitment and retention navigational challenges. And let's add those to those first two uh, statistics. Since one in 10 Americans is employed by a nonprofit and they all contribute 6% of our total GDP, this means that our board members are being looked at and looked to to aid in the leadership of critical people power challenges that all of us as nonprofit professionals are facing either as our top challenge or one of our top handful of challenges. Now, with that in mind, when we talk about board leadership and developing it, it is important to differentiate where this leadership can be applied. Board leadership is applied around matters of governance, while staff leadership is applied around matters of management. So in making this distinction, I just want to be super clear that leadership happens across all functions and all levels of a nonprofit, whether it's within the board or whether it's within the professional staff. So let's do a quick review. 
And uh, these, these functions are not going to be new to you, but I think it's a good refresher point when we're talking about leadership to make the distinction between governance and management. These are the typical board and staff functions within a nonprofit. So governance, left-hand side. Governance is the practice of the board of directors coming together to make decisions about the direction of the organization. Duties include oversight, strategic planning, decision-making, and financial planning. They all fall under governance activities. Some questions that can help us determine if something is more likely to be a governance matter include, is it big? Is it future focused? Is this core to the mission? Is this a high level policy that needs a decision to resolve a situation? Is this a red flag flying? Is this a watchdog watching? All of those compliance issues that many of you are wrestling with in your day-to-day, month-to-month cycles. Uh, compliance issues are a watchdog watching. Does the CEO want and need the board support on something? All of those questions, if it's a yes, that's a governance issue. Now, on the other side of things, management. Management supports and implements the board's defined goals and values. Staff members make routine operational decisions and they handle all of the really juicy, robust, important administrative work that makes the operation tick. The administration and the management interconnects with nearly every department in the entire organization. So our professional staff <clears throat> looks to help set direction alongside the board but then most importantly, our professional staff translates that direction, that North Star, into measurable goals, implementation plans, and accountability structures. So my first taking of the pulse for you, I am curious to know, drop in the chat, do you think is your board balanced between governance and management? Do they have the right? Yes, we have a really nice balanced governance structure, or is your board too much governance focused, or is your board too much management focused, or you can take an opt out, we're just a mess. So I'm curious, drop it in the chat, don't worry, there will not be a test after this. And in a moment, I'm gonna take a pop and look, Josh is gonna help me like spot how, like what the read is in general on are we yes balance, too much governance, too much management? What's your crystal ball saying, Josh? That is going way too quickly for me to catch up, but I'm seeing I know, a I lot. I feel like 41, 42, 43. <laughs> We're getting I a think fair that bit that, of a mess. Which is the best answer on there. So. Excellent, excellent. Well, if you just know, if you are feeling like uh, too much management or we're a mess, just know you're in good company. And this is where. Some of our key leadership styles can help us unlock and really navigate to make sure that ourselves and our board members are really dialed into the key leadership activities that help promote and, um, and nurture that balance. So in each of these activities, both the governance and the management side, obviously there's the opportunity to demonstrate leadership, right? So when we see balance, if you were one of those yes folks, like, yeah, we have balance. When we see balance between governance and management, we usually see that our leadership structures, excuse me, leadership skills are being deployed appropriately across these different functions. So we're going to take a look at my favorite four styles of leadership. These are not the only styles of leadership that exist, but these are the most um applicable, the ones, ones that are the most in line with board service. And I want, to, I want you to keep your thinking cap on because in a few minutes, I'm going to have another take your pulse sort of a question for you about your own leadership style. So let's do a quick summary and then we'll do a deep dive on each of these leadership styles. So first of all, we have democratic leadership. So democratic leadership is, as you might guess, it's a very equity oriented leadership approach that can be totally appropriate in instances where your nonprofit would benefit from having lots of discussion, lots of brainstorming and group decision-making. 
a leader is still present to help guide the process, but democratic leadership is largely looking to uh, reveal the voice of the people. Then we have strategic leadership. So definition of strategic leadership is generally understood to be the process of setting direction and then aligning and mobilizing people and resources to move in that direction. So strategic leadership, this can be particularly motivational to those who are drawn towards order, towards control, towards planning. I'm gonna raise my hand for this one. That's where I'm naturally drawn. Then we have coach style leadership. Coach style leadership might be a style that you find particularly useful in your own board service or encouraging in the board members who you're working alongside. Coach style leaders focus on developing and inspiring others to realize their own goals or goals that are external to them, which can include your organization's mission. This style is all about encouragement, it's all about drawing out the strengths of others and engaging in leadership that explores another person's growth. So it can be a really meaningful way to lead. And then finally, transformational leadership. So this is another style that is particularly suited to the nonprofit sector because it focuses on creating a strong, clear, compelling vision that you share out with others and that in turn, makes others eager to get on board with whatever you are endeavoring to accomplish. So this compelling vision could be as broad as your mission statement. It could be as specific as an idea about how to get a project done within a committee that you're involved with. So this type of leadership is all about letting the vision lead the action. So each of these leadership styles is great in the right settings, and in the right hands. So now let's take a deeper dive and look at each of these, their pros and cons, and where they work best. So democratic leadership. This is a way to motivate through the way that it engages all voices. So when everyone's involved, everyone has the chance to channel their energies around a common goal. So when board members show democratic leadership, they typically ensure that they're giving and they're expecting the same level of attention and involvement across all members of the board and the professional leadership. Now, if anybody is left out or excluded, it can be difficult in a democratic leadership style to re-engage those team members who feel like, hey, everybody else was heard, I was not. So in short, democratic leadership it promotes creativity, it's inclusive, it's collaborative, it's a great way to build trust. On the plus side, it's empowering because there is a sense of equity around the table. It also typically increases team satisfaction because when done well, everybody walks away feeling really good and really involved. On the minus side, it is slower for decision-making. Democratic leadership is not good in crisis situations when a timely decision must be made. It can also cause communication failures because sometimes when we are leading a democratic um, effort, democratic leadership effort, uh, we spend a lot of time managing communications and sometimes that can uh, get out of hand. It is great for encouraging creativity. It's great for working with younger team members, younger board members, and also engaging experts that are around the table. Now, strategic leadership. This is great when we're facing those challenging situations that democratic leadership just doesn't allow for. This is a crisis. This is an unexpected setback. Even a disruption in staffing can all benefit from the structured nature of strategic leadership. So it's particularly motivational as it ties deliberately and specifically to your overall vision and strategy. But it can be demotivational when it's applied to situations that require more creativity. Um, if you're trying to do some brainstorming or even shared leadership, strategic leadership can be a distraction. So strategic leadership is done well when there is an effective communicator at the helm. And it also is great for those who are structured finishers. Uh, it allows us to focus on the details of the future 
And it also is great for those who like to challenge the status quo. On the plus side, it's very objective. It typically builds commitment to and clarity around tasks, which is pretty cool. On the minus side, that future focus can be very distracting. Uh, it can be inflexible. It can be expensive because sometimes strategic leadership requires us to make investments um, surrounding bringing in a consultant, bringing in a specialist, uh, or making investments in particular technologies to make things happen. Um, there can be an expense that doesn't exist with some of the other leadership styles. This is great, though, for evaluating new initiatives for developing and monitoring plans, whether that's the strategic plan, it could be your annual development plan, it could be a capital campa campaign plan. Um, and then when matters are timely, strategic leadership works really, really well on a deadline. Coach style leadership. So this style is particularly appropriate and great to engage those who have been on the board for a few years. And it gives you the opportunity to mentor new board members or offer guidance and support to those who might be struggling or maybe um, kind of unengaged or, or under-engaged. So coach style leadership, it has the, the possibility, the ability to energize and empower individuals across the organization. And it's motivating because it really offers individualized attention and this really direct connection to the mission and to other leaders. So what does coach style leadership actually really look like? So in a nutshell, it's less about giving orders or blowing your whistle from the sidelines like a soccer coach. It's rather more about nurturing the development of those who are around you. So in this leadership style, if this feels like kind of a U-shaped leadership style, you typically are the type of person who sets a tone of encouragement. You allow others to take ownership of decisions and you really encourage creativity from those around you. There's a lot of time spent with coach style leadership in conversation rather than really looking for specific outcomes because this leadership style is all about giving opportunities to others to grow and to develop in their own leadership capacity. So it is not without its challenges. It takes time. It takes patience. Sometimes, speaking frankly, sometimes those around our board table who we see uh, who feel that they would be a great coach style leader uh, typically aren't necessarily the ones who would be the great coach style leadership. It's a very personality driven and a match driven um, success model. And also there is the possibility that the one who you hope is the coachy uh, may not really be all that interested in being coached. So this requires a great deal of sensitivity, whether it's to the interpersonal relationships of board members or to the board staff relationship and the balance of power and authority. But when it's done well, it can be incredibly rewarding, incredibly effective. And let's just highlight a few of the, the pieces here. With coach style leadership, the pluses are that the expectations are very, very clear. It transforms deficits into strengths in a really rich way, but it is time intensive. It is hard to do well, and it can impact progress if it's done poorly. In other words, it can do more harm than good if it's not done well and thoughtfully, but it is great at that um, ad hoc team level or the committee level, uh, when a decision isn't pressing, or if you're just looking to engage more of a long-term relationship management um, ideal. And then finally, transformational leadership. So in practice, transformational leadership, uh, transformational leaders, excuse me, do three things consistently. So first, they positively articulate the vision. Second, they communicate in a detailed fashion what success looks like. And then third, they actively encourage input and dialogue from the team. This type of leadership is often, it kind of shows up as democratic because it encourages ideas from others. It, uh, it fosters collaboration. There's a lot of input. And if there's nothing dire that needs attention or decision in the immediate sense, this style of leadership can be a great way 
to motivate others, to elevate your own experience, and to really elevate the experience of being a board member. Uh, transformational leadership, though, does have a couple potential pitfalls, just like all of them. It's difficult sometimes to maintain a sense of motivation and collaboration in the face of disappointment. If you have painted an amazing vision that has inspired action, and then you hit a road bump, Maybe you don't get that grant or maybe um, like in my home community uh, to uh, just tonight, they're uh, one of the boards that I sit on. We were scheduled to have a thousand people meet up to celebrate our 50th anniversary. And that unfortunately has been canceled because of acts of God out of our control. But that transformational vision, it is still there. And, uh, and we will, I know there's a shocked face that just floated up. Uh, it's in the works to be rescheduled, but transformational vision, if there are road, uh, road bumps along the way, it can, if we have a little bit of a miss, it can be frustrating and we do have to do a little bit extra. Additionally, if you are an individual board member, uh, and you have a specific vision for one aspect of the nonprofit's operation, you might find it difficulty, difficult to be visionary in a way that amplifies the entire vision without, um, without uh, letting go a little bit of your vision for a particular part of the program. Now, on the positive side, transformational leadership can be super motivational because it encourages the development towards a vision. But on the, on the downside, it does prioritize long-term over short-term. Sometimes we just have to be attentive to short-term needs. And there is the potential for burnout if there are more than a couple of disappointments along the way towards that big picture. Now, it is great for big picture initiatives where the vision can be rallied, as well as clearly connecting your organization's goals with individual roles. And it is in a way that inspires action. So another take your pulse. So thinking of yourself, just yourself, what do you feel is your primary leadership style? Now I'm happy to hum some Jeopardy music while you answer, but I want you to think about this closely. All of these are good leadership styles. Sometimes when I go through this conversation, and Josh has done this um, presentation with me before, sometimes it seems like, oh, transformational is the best leadership style or democratic is the best leadership style. But I will tell you all of them in the right situations and the right hands are the best. So think, think on where you guys see. Oh, I have lots of numbers popping up. Josh, are we seeing a range or are we seeing, We're seeing a, a really good mix of democratic, strategic, transformational, oh. hybrid, one and three? Uh, Very good. Yeah, it seems like there's a lot of different options there. Very um, good. As we're, as we're talking about that, um, and Emily, you and I have talked about this in the past. Um, can you talk about, you know, when is the right time for a different type of leadership style? I think one of the examples we shared in a previous webinar was, you know, if you're taking over the helm or there's a new executive director or CEO after 20 years. That mm. might be where you need a transformational leadership style that renews the vision of the mission. You can speak to it better than I can. And then um, Jane was asking, can you uh, elaborate or define the term structured finisher? Ooh, structured finisher. That's a good question, Jane. So let's first talk about, and, and I will say, spoiler alert, we will get really into Josh's initial question about what types of leadership are necessary when, but I do want to address it in a culture, just kind of an umbrella cultural sense. Um, and this is a good chance to actually spin to the second question. What do you think your board's go-to leadership style is? Um, other board members on the whole, do we have a lot of democratic leaders or a lot of transformational? So pop those in there while I, I uh, give you some insights from my perspective on how to know what leadership we need to really look to lean into. So Josh kind of scratched the surface on this. Our board has a leadership culture within it. And this is the culture of how we get things done. Every nonprofit, of course, is, and every board is a special snowflake in terms of our unique aspects. But we typically find that one of these four styles is more prevalent on the board than others. And as Josh mentioned, there are times in a nonprofit's cycle and its life where we need to make a deliberate and an intentional uh, shift 
to really lean in. So certain times, anytime we have an exec transition, anytime we have a key staff transition, that also is a great opportunity to be looking to our board's cultural style of leadership. Anytime we are considering or facing a new initiative, anytime we're facing crisis. So those are the big, the big three. Um, a new initiative could be that, hey, you know what? We're going into our next strategic planning cycle. That is a new initiative. Um, unless you're the type of organization that does a mini strategic plan every year, but most are doing you know, a three-year or a five-year plan. When you're doing those three or five-year visions, that's a great time to say, wait, 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 time out. Let's take a quick, quick, take the pulse leadership assessment across the board. Where are we lacking leadership styles? Where do we need to backfill? Now to Jane's question, um, I will speak to that. Um, a structured finisher. A structured finisher is someone who, uh, they may or may not be the idea person. Uh, we have a lot of, we typically around the nonprofit board table, we typically have a lot of very um, energized and well-intentioned folks who really want to make great change happen in our communities. That's why we all show up every day. We want to make great change happen. We want to transform our people power into impact in our communities. A structured finisher is somebody who actually is very comfortable in the implementation and accountability space. So it's somebody who, um, it, it, it's not unique to any particular role, but it's somebody who really feels driven to hold ourselves and our fellow board members and our fellow executive staff to the accountability metrics of, hey, we said we were going to do this by this time. Where are we at with that? It's the person who studies the board dashboard every month. It's the person who really scrutinizes where are we at in terms of being on or off target with our strategic planning goals. Um, I hope that you find that helpful, Jane. And as we go forward, there's going to be a couple more mentions of that similar topic with accountability. So now, oh, and Josh, one thing I didn't pop in. Do we have kind of a broad smattering of our board cultural style from a leadership perspective? A little Absolutely. Bit of I think we're a little bit overrepresented on Democrat, Democratic, okay. which I, I think is great, but a lot of people mentioning hybrid or mentioning multiple leadership styles within their boards. So right. yeah, it, it, it is a very big spectrum of answers. Good. <laughs> good, good, good. I'm glad to hear a wide mix. And that's good. That's where we want to be because as we're going back to this, uh, governance versus management comparison. So I've gone through and now this is not, this is more art than science as is our board service. And I've, I've, I've um, divvied up which aspects of governance and which aspects of management are typically best led by certain types of leadership. Now you can consider this information in one of two ways. So let's say that, um, we want to look at the second item on governance there, right? Sets the course through identification of goals, vision, and values. That is typically in the governance side. That's typically a board um, opportunity for engagement. That's typically a good match for a transformational leadership style or someone who resonates in that transformational space. So you can say, oh, you know what? My board in the coming quarter, we're really looking to reevaluate our goals, vision, values. Maybe there's a strategic planning process coming underway. Maybe you're reevaluating your mission statement. Maybe you have the opportunity to collaborate with another nonprofit. Transformational leadership is great. Now, you can look at this the other way. You can say, hey, I'm showing up as really kind of a democratic leader or my board really is in the strategic leadership space. And you can look at all of those S's or those D's on here. And you can say, hey, those are the things that we naturally have a lot of capacity around from a leadership perspective. But maybe you're missing, um, maybe you're missing strategic leadership or coach style leadership. Those look for those and that can help you um, kind of backfill from a task perspective or a um, function perspective. Now let's move on to our second point of consideration today, implementing board leadership assessments. And I wanna speak specifically about the power of self-assessments. Now, 
There are a number of assessments that exist out there, whether they are personality assessments, psychological assessments, professional, what color is your parachute, ev everything you can imagine. But what I'm talking about is a leadership specific assessment. I encourage you to dabble in this. You can do an in-person one. You can do a deep dive with a psychologist like me, or you can go and get almost as much value from um, just a Google search for online leadership assessment, because it'll give you a starting point sense of how you or your fellow board members are doing and practicing from a leadership perspective. There's also a lot of value to be had in self-observation. When you sit down, after you get this deck, um, after Aretha sends this out, and you consider the attributes of the leadership styles that we're talking about today and which are most active in your own approach, that can often give you um, quite a bit of insight into where you really resonate. Another way that you can discover more about your own leadership style is to ask for feedback. Asking for reflections from others from around what they see in you can be an amazing point of reflection. And here's a pro tip. Do not say, hey, Josh, how am I doing as a leader? Because guaranteed, Josh will do his darndest to give you really good feedback on the areas that he sees or that he has expertise in. But those may not align in your own personal development goals. Rather, to get reflections and feedback from somebody else that really speak to and are really focused on where you want to go with your leadership, consider phrasing the question something more along the lines of, hey, Josh, I'm trying to show up as a more present and um, intentional leader in our in-person board meetings. How do you think I'm doing during the board meeting in the way that I communicate my opinions, right? We've now narrowed the field. Josh can be successful in providing that feedback he also will really feel like we're investing in that relationship as a fellow board member or as a professional to um, le uh, volunteer leadership uh, relationship to manage. And then finally, a self-assessment can be really fun to do by sandboxing out and experimenting with different leadership styles. So take a look at this deck afterwards and think, you know what? I don't naturally tend towards coach style leadership. Do I have an opportunity to experiment with that style in a couple ways. That can be really, really fun and really rewarding. Now, the value of considering a self-evaluation of your leadership style when it comes to board service or supporting the board members on your nonprofit's board, the values um, really help us understand not only how we show up, but how we want to show up. So let's kind of talk psychology for a second. So we can understand our leadership style in two lenses. There's style and use, and there's the espoused style. So a real world example is think about your watch list or your saved list on any of the streaming TV services that you subscribe to. So I subscribe to all of them. And if you look at my watch list, uh, the things that I have I have flagged for future watching, it'll be things like documentaries or classic films or cooking shows or things about travel, because those are things that I think future Emily is really going to enjoy. But then if you look at what I've actually been watching, my watch history, it's like legitimately real world romance shows. And that's the difference between style and use and espoused style right? So style and use. The style and use is the means of getting what we want through our actions. This in our leadership style, whether we know it or not, this typically serves to meet our basic human needs around respect, belonging, self-esteem, confidence, personal growth, and actualization. The style and use is the action set that we use to get those needs fulfilled and to serve on our board. The espoused style is different. This is how we think we show up as a leader in our leadership roles. This is the leadership style that may be what you answered a few moments ago on what type of a leader are you? It's how we think we show up. It may not be that our behavior follows. Often we revert to mannerisms in high stakes situations that work for us as adolescents. And so you may feel like, hey, I am a coach style leader. I really I really want to encourage those around me, but yet you may naturally as part of just how you are wired, 
you may be the type of person that talks over others or really only knows your own leadership journey, or you're not really cut out for coach style leadership. That's okay. Um, but just keep in mind your spouse style. That's uh, how we think we show up. Those are those documentaries that are in my watch list. Very different from our style and use. Those are my reality romance shows. Now I bring that up to help us really get our arms around how we interpret our self evaluations of our leadership styles. Now, when we understand how we can show up as leaders for our board, in support of our board, we can also then understand how we can fill leadership gaps that exist among our board. So some common leadership exit, common leadership gaps that exist at the board level include a lack of accountability. Uh, there could be no bench. You know, when our bench is very shallow, we don't have a lot of folks to draw from for the next cycle of our board leadership. Maybe there's repetitive communications. Maybe there are silos around activity information. Those are all pretty common leadership gaps. When we know what our board's leadership gaps are and we know what our leadership style is, that we what we really can show up as, then we can find where our natural style aligns with our organization's needs. Where can we adapt and where can we flex? to really help fill those gaps. We can also interpret our own understanding of our nonprofit leadership to develop an improvement plan. So going beyond just tinkering in a sandbox situation, we can look to really, in a structural sort of way, develop one or two leadership attributes around our key board responsibility or our area of focus or that that we want to bring out in our board members. We can structure this in a way that can help us see if we are improving, such as I want to ask two questions during each board meeting, or I want to really understand the financials, or whatever it may be related to one piece of the operation. You can also get a better sense of self. And this goes outside of the board room, and this actually goes into your general professional life, into your personal life, whether you are nonprofit professional staff or whether you are a board member, either way, identifying and leaning into your secret sauce and developing parameters about where you want to take your leadership and where you don't can be, it can become your superpower. Knowing that, you know, for me personally, after having 20 years in the development aspect, um, i I don't have a draw towards serving on the development committee, even though I do have that natural leadership tendency. But I know that my boundaries are that I want to continue to develop leadership. And so I use that as a stepping stone. And I question for you, where are your stepping stones and what is your secret sauce that you want to use or not use? Okay, we're going to start tying this up in a neat bow. We're going to bring together those core leadership styles how you're understanding yourself and your own leadership to really look at how we can foster collaboration and strengthen our relationships. Now, this is the part that I mentioned uh, to Josh's earlier question about, um, you know, how do we know when to really lean into what type of leadership or how do we know when our nonprofit might need a specific type of leadership wholesale? And this is, um, this is when we look to develop an adaptive or a dynamic leadership approach. So adaptive leadership and dynamic leadership, those aren't really leadership styles, but they're just how we deploy our leadership. So adaptive leadership really builds um, on kind of a traditional leadership approach because it, it emphasizes your ability to listen and interact with others in a way to understand their feelings, their needs, their perspectives. You do that before you take any specific type of leadership activity. So it's really, I'm, I'm scanning, I'm looking, what is the matter at hand? What is it that we're talking about? What are the outcomes? And then I consciously think through, how do I wanna show up as a leader? This helps us stay in tune with our own feelings around a particular matter. And it helps us adjust our leadership according to the situation or where the nonprofit is at in its life cycle. So for example, let's imagine that your nonprofit board is wrestling with a decision about whether or not to join a coalition with other local nonprofit organizations. 
So adaptive leadership would help you to first assess the situation and then decide whether a strategic or transformational approach would be a more effective in this context. You might find that more of a strategic approach is needed in order to properly assess the situation, discuss potential steps. But you also might find that a transformational approach might be better suited when you're closer to the decision time, when you really could offer a rallying cry around getting this opportunity considered for how it aligns with your mission. So in each of these four leadership styles that we talked about, there's the opportunity to use these adaptive techniques. Now, this concept addresses some of the difficult to define challenges that we face in our work with an approach that's both proactive and reflective. And it pairs well with all of the leadership stuff that we just talked about. So there are four phases to an adaptive leadership approach. So we start with anticipation. This is the process of trying to make sense and make meaning of an ambiguous and a rapidly changing reality. So when it comes to board service, this often means doing some amount of prediction, some amount of crystal ball work on what could be a difficult topic or situation, thinking ahead to how other board members' emotions might come into play, or how do we think this discussion is gonna go? Anticipation, this first phase, this is all about expecting the unexpected. Articulation, this is the way we communicate about our anticipation. It is a way that builds collective understanding. It is looking to communicate in a way that gives, um, that generates support for action. And within the board's work, the professional staff and the board members can work towards articulating the nonprofit's needs in a way that resonates with others. So might be um, this might be where your impact stories, where your testimonials, your anecdotes, all of those reviews of your goals, or simply sharing a personal, this is why this matters to me. All of that is in the articulation phase. Now, adaptation, the third phase of adaptive leadership approaches, this is where we gather feedback and where we look at data, where we normalize continuous learning. So when it comes to board service, this means being open to new ways of doing things. So just as the nonprofit landscape is always changing, so too must our leadership approach in the sector keep evolving because we're going to be presented with evolving situations all the time. So this might be manifesting in attention to building certain capacities within our nonprofit or simply taking a new approach to how we spend our time during board meetings. So regardless of the change that your board explores, the adaptation phase should really be based on the data and the feedback so that you are really building in that continuous improvement. And then the fourth step, fourth step of adaptive leadership in a way that builds collaboration is accountability. So this is the aspect of adaptive leadership that maximizes transparency and decision-making, keeps everyone focused on who will do what by when. If you've ever worked with me before as one of my client teams, you will hear me say that in almost every conversation we have. Who will do what by when? In terms of board service, accountability directly ties to both our formal and our informal goals. So formal goals, think of those like your strategic plan, your annual plan. Um, informal goals could be your board annual self-assessment, your CEO assessment, things that you agreed as a group to do better around. Those are your informal goals. And so when we use adaptive leadership mechanisms, Accountability helps us regularly track and report back on our board-related data. And it helps us see where our um, where we need to make adjustments, where we need to celebrate accomplishments. And so these four aspects work together in how we deploy our leadership. So final question for you. I'm curious, which of these phases do you think your board is really, really great at? Is it the anticipation, like predicting sticky situations? Is it articulation, communicating needs and kind of what kind of leadership we're going to need? Is it adaptations, staying flexible, quick on your feet regarding leadership? Or is it accountability, holding ourselves accountable for making all those good things happen? Josh, what are we seeing? 
Oh, oh, be sure to turn on your microphone, Mr. Palmer. Thank you. I'm still doing that three years after the pandemic. I know, all of us. <laughs> Articulation adaptation seem to be the, the most popular uh -huh. answer. Uh, can we choose none of the above? Is an also you, you also can definitely choose. If you were somebody who on that very first slide said, we're a mess, you can also choose none of the above. That is always, <laughs> the, always an, an opportunity there. And that tells us that, okay, there are some leadership lessons and leadership um, exploration that could be done within your within your group. And this is very interesting. We're seeing um, a lot, a fair, fair bit of a leaning towards articulation and ad adaptation. The last time that Josh and I did this presentation to a different group, we saw there was a strong leaning towards anticipation. And so I'm curious, it could be the time of year because he and I did it at the start of a, of a July to June fiscal year. Uh, which is very common, of course, for many of our nonprofits. I'm also wondering if it could just be that our TechSoup group is that much farther along in really looking to um, uh, communicate and really flex around their leadership needs. So I don't know that I'll get to the bottom of that mystery on this call, but keep in mind that each of these four areas, these are each ways they don't have to happen in this order, but they typically do. These are each ways to really dig in on how we are leveraging our leadership to really create a collaborative board experience that is activating around strong governance practices. And that's entirely what this webinar today is about. So let's close up with, I have two more slides for you, just about kind of giving us a nice neat and tidy bow on this, um, an umbrella thought about how all of this works together to strengthen our strengthen the relationships across the board. So our leadership awareness in ourselves and in our board, this really looks to, um, it serves to work together to strengthen the relationships as we look to relational awareness. This is where we look at um, how we think, feel, and act within us between us and around us. So that's individual, that's interpersonal, and then that's intergroup. We also can really leverage what we've talked about today in order to build trust in others. Because when we understand that there are a variety of leadership styles and a means of applying them, we can trust and honor the diversity of talent that exists around the board table. Um, in other words, understanding that there's not just one way to lead. And then leading yourself. Self-awareness of your own leadership style can be an antidote to any leadership struggles that you have. If you're ever someone who struggles with imposter syndrome, feelings of inadequacy, self-doubt about what you bring to your board service, or can I bring my board to the ultimate um, good leadership that they are capable of, Understanding your own leadership styles can be an antidote to that that helps you get past that and really get into an effective place. So final thing before we maybe have time for a couple questions is taking action. So I encourage you to go forward from this webinar and try one thing. I also encourage you to share with a trusted peer your goal to elevate, expand, and explore your own leadership. This might look like recognizing your intuition. It might be reviewing your agenda items in advance and predicting what type of leadership style you might wanna use. If you're using a peer model, this could be asking your exec or your chair where they see leadership gaps, or it could be something as simple as doing just a post-mortem, like a, a, an after analysis uh, on a recent issue that you were involved with and see how did I show up as a leader? And with that said, we have about seven minutes left for our closing comments, as well as a couple of questions. I am all ears and I would love to chat with you. And I'm gonna stop my share right now. Great, Emily, there was one question we didn't get to that was a little bit yes. early in the presentation. They were asking, I think it was the first slide you shared a number of stats. Um, I, I know there was two slides with stats. I think it was the first slide. Yes. Uh, uh, they were asking what the sourcing was on that. Oh, I, I will I will share out the source because it's in my um, prep notes. I'll share out the source with you as we share the deck. It is cited in the deck. Great, yeah. great. No problem. All right, Chris asks, how do you initiate the conversation of introducing those principles to a board whose chair is saying she is democratic but almost authoritative? 
<laughs> oh, oh, oh. And so that's a great example of that um, style and use versus espoused style, right? That often, oh, that so often comes up. Um, I see it often come up and I always get a kick out of it when we have one of our seasoned board members who might often play kind of the the devil's advocate or might be the contrarian in the group when they are the first one to volunteer to be, um, yeah, send her this video. I like that, Aretha. Uh, when that, that kind of cantankerous board member signs up to be the first board buddy, right? Like, oh, I want to be a coach style leader. And I always get a good chuckle out of that because, um, you know, sometimes self-awareness is, is just lost, right? So, uh, how to broach that subject with someone who, um, who is almost authoritative and stuff. So, you know, we are all used to, and I, this actually came up, a very similar question came up yesterday at a similar webinar that I did about board leadership with United Way of Rhode Island. And the question was about understanding our board leadership gaps. And so I think if you have a board chair who you, um, predict accurately or not, that there could be some resistance in the room to talking about um, shifting up and really adapting in our leadership. Many of us use a board matrix as we're considering our board skills, abilities. Um, right within the onboard platform, there is some wonderful technology around how to really assess what each board member brings to the table, right? Whether that's a professional, um, you know, we have legal and financial and community leadership. We also have demographics, we have age, we have place in life, we have all the things, right? Let's add another column when you're having that conversation with your chair on primary leadership style or perceived leadership style, right? And then if you were to limit it to the four leadership styles that we discussed today, uh, that could probably open up a conversation that leans into that chair's self-perception as democratic while also kind of activating perhaps some of her um, maybe overuse of the strategic leadership style. We don't have any other open questions. Oh, uh, would like to request a board meeting so I'm the focus of this one. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, do board assessment, look at our vision, what is it and how do we count for our goals? Yeah, that's great, Chris. Yes. Um, Faith asks, how do you initiate a discussion on motivation for being part of a board when it's apparent that at least three or four are on the board uh, are all are there to as a favor to fill a seat? You know, oh. board members are. I'm sorry, it dropped off their faith. Uh, but yeah, great example. You know, especially in a nonprofit scenario, is your is your board member a fundraising board member? Or are they a working board member? Uh, and just a, a little bit of data from the onboard um, uh, board effectiveness survey that we do: seventeen percent of board members are deemed ineffective by their peers. So you're not alone there, faith, and 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 um, answering that. But anyway, curious your your reaction to how do you get that 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 board member more productive or change the the composition of the board, as it were? You know, so uh, boy, having a warm body board. That is just such a, it's a tricky spot to be in. So my heart goes out to you. I know how much that weighs on your mind. You know, my my sense without knowing, without knowing your board, of course, is there has to be a, a lead up of conversation around showing up, what it means to be an engaged board member uh, with your particular nonprofit. And really looking to change the composition. Now, changing the composition of your board does take time, right? Until somebody needs to cycle off. But there are some robust conversations and it's a good leadership opportunity for you too to discuss perhaps with some of those who are just holding a seat as a favor or they're just helping you get to quorum or, or whatever their level of disengagement might be. When you have a few board, uh, a few interested parties few people that are really interested in serving on your board, you can have an honest conversation with those who might want to roll off to say, hey, we would love to give your seat to somebody who really wants to be on our board. Um, you'd handle it much more sensitively. And I do see Regina has a question in the Q&A. How would you use this to prepare a board that will be hiring an executive director to manage the org after a 10-year gap of having an executive director? Such a transition time. Excited for you, Regina, but wow, what a what a challenge. So I think the first thing first, um, my my gut, and I would be interested, Josh, if you have an uh, an additional perspective. But my gut 
is to go through and really dig deep into that governance versus management. If you have had a gap in, uh, of, if you've had a gap in 10 months, let alone 10 years uh, of professional leadership or an executive level professional leader, uh, it will be a good reminder for your board and to really spin that in a positive way. What a wonderful opportunity you have to now really strengthen that management muscle within your operation. And naturally some leadership conversations will come from that. Yeah, my take on that as we wrap up here, I know we're just oh, we're at time at the moment is, yeah, absolutely. You're reviewing that relationship between the board and the executive director. Probably a good time to look at your charter or some of your committee charters, those types of things as well. Is the board going to do uh, an effective job for that executive director to be successful in their role? So that's my take. Exactly. exactly. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Josh, do you have any wrap-up comments that we should make? No, thank you. It's always a pleasure to join you, Emily, and thank you, TechSoup, for presenting the, the opportunity for us to be here with you. I hope every, everybody found it engaging and helpful. And uh, yeah, have a great afternoon. Stay safe in Florida, folks. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you, everybody. I look forward to hearing from you and your wonderful leadership successes going forward. Bye-bye, everybody.